ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vindu Goyle, Quentin Hardy, Farhad Manju, Claire Kane Miller, David Streitfeld, Molly Wood, and moderator John Markoff from the New York Times. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start this by asking. This is this is actually about half of our team that covers technology, which is really striking because once upon a time it was just me, and it just shows how the Times has really uh, changed their commitment to to uh, covering technology. Today's uh, your paper today has uh, largely Quentin's work product, but I, I want to ask uh, to start if each one of you will briefly describe what your beat is for the paper. Can we start with Molly? personal technology columnist, relatively new at the Times. Um, I essentially cover how technology fits into your real life. My beat is to cast the critical eye on everything in technology that everybody else is most enthusiastic about. <laughs> <laughs> I write for The Upshot, which is a new section of the New York Times that covers policy and economics and life. And I cover tech as well as gender, work, and family. Um, I write the state of the art column, which is where I write about whatever's interesting in tech, from Uber to Soylent. I cover enterprise technology, business computing, but increasingly that is cloud computing and how it's being percolate, how it's percolating across the world. Uh, I cover social media companies like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, and also the granddaddy of the internet, Yahoo. So I wanted to start this morning with just a simple observation. And it's based on a uh, piece that Richard Florida, who's a sociologist, wrote uh, last year. And he, he did something that was really quite novel. He took venture capital investments uh, in Silicon Valley and broke them down by zip code. And sure enough, if you look at the valley by zip code now, um, the center of Silicon Valley is at the foot of Potrero Hill. Guess where you are right now? We are at the center of Silicon Valley, which just as someone who once upon a time grew up in Palo Alto, which once, once upon a time was the center of Silicon Valley, kind of blows my mind. And I kind of want to start by asking you, what does it mean that Silicon Valley has moved from San Jose and Palo Alto to San Francisco? Quentin? Well. And, and I mean, has it? I'd push back on Richard Ford a little bit. Part of what that says is, this has become a very rich area for medical and biological work, and it's high capital. And I think one of the most important things that's happened is the incredibly low cost of starting stuff. And just because venture is putting a lot of money there in expensive things like buildings or biomedical, that doesn't mean it's the greatest source of activity. But why did it, why did it come to San Francisco rather than going to San Jose? There's lots of low cost, relatively low cost real estate in San because Jose. Because tech has moved from being an industrial concern and a military concern to a consumer and social concern, and people are drawn to lifestyle aspects, both in their work and their personal lives. They want to be in an interesting, exciting city. Right. I also think it's interesting that it hasn't moved that much. I mean, it's moved like 30 miles when sort of the promise of the internet was to liberate us from, from geography, where you might have thought, you know, before the internet came along in the 90s, that like people would, that uh, the tech industry and all other industries could be spread out in far, you know, far apart and people could work in, in, you know, in wide apart places. And we don't see that. So what's important about place? It, it's the culture, it's a network, it's the, the uh, funders, everyone wants to be here because this is where they'll put money in your company and then you know this is where the engineers come and so it's sort of like become the white hot center of, of the tech industry. I think that's another thing. Of, go ahead. Sure? Claire first and then Molly. You could also argue that it, it oh. represents, uh, as, as a nod to our cloud section, that it represents a move away from the physical and into the digital, into the information age, that we, so many of the startups that are being funded now in San Francisco proper don't make a thing, they make an app or they make some version of software, or they make something that lives in the cloud. And they, you know, frankly, they don't need as much space. And there's also a talent war here. The biggest, most valuable thing is the engineers to work at these companies, and most of them are in their 20s. Most of them are 20-something men. And 20-something men would prefer to live in the city. So it's not so cool to get an apartment in San Jose anymore. It's cooler to live up here and work up here. And I think that's a big reason that a lot of the startups are moving. Uh, Molly, you mentioned sort of building an, uh, an app rather than 
making something. Uh, the Times had a, an interesting magazine cover probably two months ago about, it was called Silicon Valley's Youth Problem, basically arguing that uh, in Silicon Valley we used to do fundamental things and now we write apps. I mean, how much yeah. truth is, is, is that? I mean, you know, I think there is some truth to that, and I think some of that is a little bit of a coverage bias. We are so interested in apps, and we cover social, but there are amazing things happening in technology that have to do with science, and that have to do with manufacturing, and that have to do with medicine, um, that I think don't necessarily always get covered under the rubric of technology, and so it does become easy to believe that Silicon Valley is only interested in apps that tell you where your friends are or how to find a better restaurant, which is a little sad, frankly. There's so much more to it. There's also an enormous infrastructure being built that is as advanced and kind of breathtaking as the moonshot. I, I was recently at a company where we could monitor response times for smartphones around the world on how quick it took to download an app. And in the United States, it takes about 300 milliseconds before you start to hear from your app once it's loaded. And they were laughing at people, or astonished, I should say, at people in Azerbaijan and Sri Lanka because it took two seconds from there to get a response on your app. And you know, when I was a kid, you had to bet, book a call later in the week if you wanted to like talk internationally. The infrastructure we have built around the planet and that Zuckerberg and Google are starting to roll out is just breathtaking. You know, and we're connecting people to supercomputers at a rate nobody's ever seen before. It's incredible. Manufacturing is no longer here. Does it matter? Can Silicon Valley exist if things are made in Asia? I think it. I, I think, I think it doesn't matter to the companies out here, right? Like the way that they do it is very efficient, and they can kind of manufacture things out there. So it doesn't matter for that industry, for the hardware. I mean, in in fact, what we're seeing is an increasing number of sort of startups that are doing hardware, and they can do it because they can, you know, build prototypes here with three D printing and uh, get funded here with things like Kickstarter, and then sort of move the mass manufacturing out there. Given what you know about. Robotics, John, whose hand would you want to hold, China's or the U.S.? Well, I, mean, I, I think it may start to matter. I, I do. I, I, I think it may start to matter, and not necessarily from the economic perspective of the companies, but from the sort of consumer perspective. The more, I mean, not to get too pie in the sky, but the more we hear about pollution, the more we hear about working conditions, that there is, you see Apple moving some manufacturing to the U.S. You see more of a push in that direction. And so it may start to matter for reasons that have less to do with fabulous efficiencies and more to do with ethics, yeah. hopefully. So the, uh, the other aspect of uh, the San Francisco-zation of, of Silicon Valley is um, Mary Meeker every year puts out this sort of ambitious set of charts about, about the state of the internet. And she had three or four charts um, this year that suggested that the bubble really wasn't a bubble. Um, However, I think if you're in San Francisco these days, it, it feels pretty much like it's a bubble. Where are you guys on whether this is a bubble and whether this is different than, than uh, 2000 or 2008 even? Definitely people are starting companies faster, selling them faster, making more money than they ever were. So in that sense, at least the scale is bigger. Um, this has, has to be the moment in time when more people have gotten rich quicker in one place than ever before. The biggest difference, though, in my mind, is that these companies, for the most part, aren't yet going public. So Uber is now valued at $18 billion. Maybe that's ridiculous and absurd, and maybe it will never be worth that much. But if it's not, the people who lose are the venture capitalists who invested right. in it. The people who lose are not your average Joe who's investing in the stock market. And that's what it was during the first bubble. A few companies have gone public, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, but you know, it's, very, it's very minimal and one of the big requirements for going public now is to show a business model and maybe even some profit, which wasn't, wasn't around last time. Yeah, and when you don't show profit, you get, you, know, you get punished by the markets. We've seen this with Zynga and Twitter too recently. I mean, making money is like a fundamental thing now where it wasn't uh, you know, 12 years ago. So, so there's one, or, sorry, go ahead. So there's, there's one thing that's very similar in that, um, in that dot-com bubble, it was all about eyeballs, and now it's all about growth. So you see a company like Twitter, which has a pretty substantial presence, pretty good business model, they're getting punished in the stock market because they don't have growth. LinkedIn is ha also having slowing growth, and then Facebook, meanwhile, doing really well. Their stock is being rewarded. So I think investors are a little bit more discriminating than they were the last time around in 2000, and uh, we may see a little bit more caution 
in the public markets at least. It is very secular. It's largely around social media companies. The enterprise companies that are going public have businesses and have revenues. You know, in 99, European teleco telcos, which should be boring companies, spent $50 billion just for the rights to certain radio spectrum with no real business plan whatsoever. We're nothing like that model now. Interesting. So the consensus, just to get you all on record, it's, it's, is it, it's different this time. It's always different. Yeah, I mean, it, is, it is a bubble, but it's the kind of bubble that is not necessarily going to burst with broad reaching implications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well put. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't quite want to let, let this go just yet. How many of you been to, to this, uh, how many of you visited this in, new institution in the city called the Battery Club? Heck yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it. I'm like a little embarrassed to <laughs> Well, and had a drink with bubbles in it. <laughs> so, you know, the turn of the last century, there was the Bohemian Club and the Pacific Union Club, and here we are in this era where all of a sudden we have a, a social club that smacks of, of, maybe they claim not great wealth, but doesn't it represent some, something about what's going on now that's, that's well, sort of it's, it's, worth noting? I mean, it's this problem here in, in San Francisco, but it's a, it's a larger problem being driven by, uh, by technology, which is rising inequality. I mean, if you work with computers or have some skill at like evading the, the robots, then, then you'll be fine and you'll actually make a lot of money. But if you don't, if your work is going to be replaced by robots, then you know, you're at this lower rung and you can't, you can't really escape it. Um, I think that's what it speaks to. I was, people have always had clubs. I mean, it is, <laughs> it, it's rich people who have a club. Like, it's not, maybe it's not great wealth, but come on. To, to, to Groucho Mark's point, do you know which class is not acceptable for membership in the, uh, the Battery Club? That would be us. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, you're kidding. I thought Yeah, Kara was, was in it. Wait, I was going to say, with one very notable exception. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was in Japan in the late 80s, early 90s, and then I was here for the internet bubble. So I'm like a bubble magnet. And, you know, bubbles, <laughs> the thing about bubbles that is true is they happen because something really new and different is going on. And the market doesn't know how to value that. And so it tends to like overshoot. Like the internet was huge in the mid 90s. It was going to be a big thing. And everything people said would happen kind of has happened. It was just impossible to say where and how that would happen. So the market overvalues that like crazy. And then when you know, reality sets in, it collapses. And that's kind of happening now, certainly for cloud. You know, what we wrote the section about today, um, there's, it's hard to overstate how dramatic and sweeping a change this will be to every business practice to every part of the world we touch. So yeah, it's getting overvalued, but it's still a dramatic change. On the other hand, when wouldn't your Japan example go against that, where Japan has never really recovered from its bubble, what, 20 years ago? The initial part of the Japanese bubble was OK. It was, it was a, a marker for the rise of Asia after the Second World War. Then they took that and geared it into a whole lot of cheap real estate deals and bad accounting, and it got out of hand. But the first part of it was legit, and all those tiger economies that rose up on the heels of that, it's absolutely true. Singapore but, is a great country now. Right, but Japan has still never quite recovered from that. Yes, you can blow it. There's no question. You can spend the money wrong. And that happened here with the internet. You know, we, there were empty buildings along 101 for the next five years. But at the core, the observation that something dramatic is going on and it will touch all parts of the economy was true in the 80s in Asia. And it was true with the internet in the 90s, and I think it's true now with cloud and social and mobile. It's also been true in San Francisco since the gold rush. If you talk to historians about this place, it's always been a place where people get rich very quickly, and new things come and change everything. And I recently saw someone post on Twitter a page from a history book about the 1930s in San Francisco, and it was the exact description of what we're talking about today. So, you know, people so scared, what's going to happen to the artists and the poets because everyone's getting rich so quickly with this new industry. And it's just always been a city where that happens. So, uh, let's not let San Francisco get away just yet. If, if you live here, or if you live on the peninsula, one of the sort of striking things on the streets now is there are Amazon Fresh and Google Shopping Express vans everywhere. Is this more than Webvan 2.0? It is Webvan. <laughs> so, is it this time for real? But Webvan was only Webvan, so it had no infrastructure and no money to be able to sustain okay. that 
business model. Like presumably Google and, I mean, we know that Google and sometimes Amazon are making money in other ways. I mean, one of the things that's great about Amazon is they don't need to make money, right? Like their <laughs> investors will keep uh, their stock up and they, they don't have to make any profit. So this, this is really helpful for us. Like we can get Amazon fresh and even if it's a not completely profitable business model, uh, you know, someone delivers groceries to you for a reasonable price, that's okay. Ha have any of you actually purchased stuff from either of those or Instacart dinner? Has anybody? I've done, I have to say the thing to do is Amazon and Google are not going out of business, but the other ones do, just like the 90s. So there was this, uh, this company, I can't remember the name of it now, it was only last year, and they were delivering wine, free delivery, $15, of bo $15 bottles of wine to your doorstep in under an hour. And I just knew this wouldn't be around, so I used it as much as I could. And sure enough, like six months later, I got an email saying, you know, we are, we're going out of business and, and shutting down. So, you know, I, I'm not sure. Make, make no mistake, there will be carnage. There will be. There is always a correction. There is no question that there are too many companies and too many rich people for this small space. And there will be blood in the streets and companies will disappear and VCs will lose a lot of money. It's just that it might not tank the global economy as much as it did last time. Oh, yeah. So yay for that. Look right. at the kind of coverage you were doing in the 80s and look how much change there's been. Things blow up, but things also rise from the wreckage that are fantastic. I mentioned that telecom bubble in the late 90s. You know who bought a lot of that dark fiber for communications? Google. Google. Yeah. And that worked out okay for them. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one of the, so I, when I went to get my Google car ride, the latest iteration of the Google car ride, the, the Google car that doesn't have a steering wheel in it. On my way from Stanford to Mountain View, which is only about three miles, I passed, uh, I think, four Google Shopping Express vans. And it made me wonder whether that wasn't part of Google's agenda, I mean, to sort of conflate the, the shopping stuff with the Google car, driverless car story. Um, does, 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 Google have a, a, does Google have a business in either place? Let's, let's forget about the bigger picture, can, can Google compete with Amazon on, on delivering stuff? It will try. And, I mean, they're trying now. Well, well, they're trying and there's a whole bunch of other startups. I was reminded when Claire was talking about the wine uh, delivered, that, that model has not died out. I think in Chicago there are six different startups that will deliver you hard liquor in under an hour, which is somewhat controversial because Mainly it's frat kids who want this. And if you need liquor that much that quickly, maybe you shouldn't have it. But these companies are being funded. They're out there. They're doing it. The successful one will be bought by Google or Amazon, or Amazon or Google will uh, just incorporate that into their business model. They want to deliver everything all the time. I have to be honest, though, that I treat every new Google product with the same trepidation that Claire described about the wine startup. Because Google gets into things and they don't always follow through. And it, it may be a lack of focus or it may be that they lose interest or that they realize they can't make money on it or that people don't like it for some reason. But if I had to pick one of those two things, I guess I would go with Amazon Fresh or Instacart because I just don't, or I would use the Google thing as much as I could, except that I live in the hinterlands of Oakland, so I'm shut out for now. Um, but I don't, I don't always trust that Google's going to follow through with things and, and execute all the way if it's not a core business. The business model for Shopping Express is not sustainable. I mean, they're charging nothing, and they're using human beings to go shop at multiple stores and bring you stuff. And that's just not going to work. They may make it up on volume. On volume. On volume. <laughs> uh, they're also competing I mean, with Amazon. I mean, I think one of the things that people don't realize is that Google and Amazon are huge competitors. Google makes most of its advertising dollars from shopping ads. So when someone searches for a microwave or whatever they want to buy on Google, and they show an ad, that's where they make most of their money. Amazon now has more shopping searches than Google, a, a bigger share of shopping searches. More and more when people want to buy something, they go straight to Amazon.com and search for it. That's a big threat to Google, and I think that's why they're getting into it. I think one of the things that's interesting about what we're discussing here is it's hard to know exactly how they plan to make money. They control so many parts of the process at this point. They'll learn about your taste in food. They'll manage the driving of cars and can perhaps deliver them more efficiently than anything before. You've got the rise of these big comprehensive companies like Amazon and Google that are watching you in so many ways and understand so many ways that things are produced and shipped that they can kind of find advertising opportunities or they can find process opportunities, new efficiencies they can create. 
And we talk about this tech revolution as empowering individuals, but it's also creating companies that are more comprehensive and control our lives pervasively than ever before. Yeah. Essentially, we here in the Bay Area are the guinea pigs for all this, the testing ground, the proving ground for it. The ones that really work will end up in Kansas City and be popular there. So uh, to, to that point, uh, you know, we go through these buzzwords. It's buzzword du jour, uh, uh, cloud computing, or big data, or internet of things. I was uh, struck by Molly's column in your video. Have we crossed the line on the internet of things? Because you can go to Lowe's now, and there, I was, I was struck by how many internet of thing options are at Lowe's. Is, is it real? Yeah, so this is a, the, a fascinating development that I just discovered. I wrote a column about home automation, smart home automation. And apparently Lowe's, as a retailer, has decided to put themselves in the business of trying to unify the Internet of Things. So they make their own hub for controlling smart home devices, and they will only sell devices at Lowe's that work with that hub. So that they've certified it, and they can sort of give tech support on site. And it really points to the change that is happening across all industries, where everybody is all of a sudden in the data business. Lowe's has an app. Lowe's has a cloud platform. Um, but it's, it also points to the fact that, you know, probably on the heels of Nest, every device feels like it needs to be smart or connected now. And it is something that, is, that people are becoming aware of. It just isn't all the way mature. It doesn't work as well as it could. But for those, but for those who are hobbyists anywhere in the country, not just here, you can have a reasonably good experience, experience with a very local Internet of Things. We're not at the point yet where the Internet of Things is extremely useful, but it sort of feels like the early days of the web or the early, probably the early days of the PC, where it's fun for hobbyists to experiment with, but I don't think it's sort of uh, you know, useful for, for most consumers. But I think we'll get there. I mean, we'll, we, or, or we, you know, the companies may die trying. But it's so much more than a consumer thing. You know, GE makes a turbine with 12,000 sensors on it right. that talks about performance in all sorts of ways. And that helps them do maintenance and predict electrical demand and, you know, run a system much cheaper. And the industrial side of the Internet of Things is very, very real. And security, security and monitoring are the number one reasons that people get into home automation. And that arguably does have a use. I mean, people can tell if they've left the door unlocks, doors unlocked and, and lock them remotely. They can find out if there's a burglar at their house and call the police remotely. Yeah. Well, there's some utility there that is growing. I met a company last night called Snoopy that makes these sensors that you can put under your dishwasher, under your toilet, under your washing machine, and they last basically for as long as, as anyone would live in a house. And insurance companies are requiring that people buy them and then giving them discounts on their policies because they tell you if you have a leak. So insurance companies who know how much water damage costs now want you to put these things in your house. So it's, it's other things besides just the consumer. Could they come up with a better name than Snoopy? Cause that's I thought it was a pet related <laughs> It's a little name. creepy. It's well, spelled with a U instead of two O's. Oh, it's OK then. <laughs> I do wonder whether there's going to be a backlash, though, on all this monitoring. You know, Internet of Things is also these health monitoring devices. Do people really want all of this information about their home, about their personal health, about their lives up there in the cloud? And who knows really what company is going to do something with it, or if the NSA comes knocking at some company's if door? If it appeals to our narcissism, yeah. That will well, I mean, <laughs> I think security and control of your own data will be the hottest topic of the next. But, but I mean, Claire hit on a, an interesting thing. Like, insurance companies might require you to have this stuff. And you may, you know, may, you may do it because you'll get a huge discount from your uh, you know, your insurance company, your auto insurance right. company, your home insurance company, insurance others. insurance company could also ding me because I don't have, like, enough points on my fitness tracker today. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like a safe your, club card. You'll pay a premium to have ordinary service. Right. Your boss might require that you get it to get lower premiums for your health insurance. People love this stuff, and it creeps them out. Often <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, at the same that's time. That's basically like tech in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> So we've gotten through the almost the entire panel. We haven't mentioned Apple. Is, is that significant? Is, are we in some sort of sea change that the first topic in Silicon Valley is not Apple computer? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, the whole th everything we've talked about here has touched on the one device that Apple made with a smartphone that yeah. like changed everything. And I, you know, maybe maybe they'll do that again, or maybe they won't. But they'll still keep making a lot of money because of that one device. They're building a huge cloud center. Soon there will be an Apple Watch, and it will have all sorts of human monitoring that people will rush to because it will be beautifully packaged. So 
A, a, a final question, we're getting near the end. Um, Silicon Valley has lived off of platforms. Can anyone conceive of a next platform past the smartphone? Are there other platforms? Past the cloud? Past the cloud? Well, Mark Zuckerberg certainly thinks virtual reality will be yeah. the next platform. I'm not, I'm not sure he's right about that, uh, if the technology is advanced enough, but it has some potential. There is no like Internet of Things platform yet. There are companies trying to build it, but there's no kind of operating system for all these different devices, something that connects them and, and makes them uh, comprehensive. We may leave the device altogether in some ways. It'll just be a retinal scan, and the device at hand is, will immediately identify you and you know, personalize the internet for you on some screen that's just lying around. And the screens will be on our walls or maybe eventually in our contact lenses and it won't be about a device at all. Yeah, it's the like internet's the body, exploding body across body everything. Yeah. Yeah. And the really rich, really famous people will make sure they have none of this. <laughs> that will be the sign of their distinction. <laughs> they will be invisible on the internet because they'll have been scrubbed from all Google searches. They will not be uh, seen anywhere. When everyone can be famous, the cool thing will be to be hidden. To be forgotten. Yeah. So, one, one, I've always, I always wondered if, if Silicon Valley was in danger. What was, how would you know if it was over? You know, when would it be that um, just the tail fins were changing and fundamental innovation wasn't happening? Any signs that the valley is, is weak or fragile? Or Farhad, that it's going to spread throughout the whole world and the, the, the I, tech plan build? So so I think maybe you're asking the wrong crowd, because like the people who are here, like everyone that I talk to, everyone that we talk to, feel like the valley is never going to uh, go away. But probably they'll they they won't know, right? It'll some new place and some new thing will 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 take us by surprise, and the people out here will be blindsided by it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I think the valley is overexposed on dumb apps, right? Like I think that there is so much amazing technology and technological development happening, happening throughout the world that the, the Valley cannot, the Valley will be headed for a fall, inevitably. There's this really interesting uh, kind of dis like disconnection between what's going on here and like all of the innovation in, in Asia, especially in China, with social apps and other things that are happening there. And there's no, like you talk to, like I talk to VCs out here and they aren't very familiar with those Chinese apps or how they work or how that market works. And if that, you know, that market is the hugest internet market in the world, and if these companies out here don't succeed there, there may be problems. I, here's a, a salted peanut. Last year, four big national pizza chains had business go up 6%. And 70,000 small pizzerias saw business decline 24%. And the difference was the big guys knew how to engage social media which is still Valley-based. Corporate America is coming here to figure out what goes on. Like, used to be the Valley had to go to Washington or go to New York and sell itself. Companies are coming here and establishing research centers or trying to learn how this stuff works because they all realize everything touches their business now. So for the near future, I really don't see a big problem. Okay. Yeah. Are, we, are we out of, out of time or do we have time for questions for the audience? What's, what, does the, what is the clock telling me? No answer. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes for questions. Oh, five minutes. For questions. Okay. Okay. Let's let's get the audience involved. Please identify yourself. My name is uh, Glenn Fukushima. I'm with the Center for American Progress, a think tank in Washington D.C. I um, live in San Francisco and Washington D.C. both. In the 1980s, I was at U.S. Chair negotiating trade agreements with Japan on semiconductors and other issues. I knew Quentin at the time. And I worked for four years at a Silicon Valley software company in, in the 2000s. And my question is this. When I go back between San Francisco and, and, and uh, the Bay Area and Washington, D.C., there's such a total disconnect between what is motivating, animating these two communities. And yet, what goes on in each is obviously strongly affected by the other. And, in, and so my question is, for those of you working in Silicon Valley, do you think that the people here are increasingly engage with what's going on in Washington with regard to tax policy, immigration policy, antitrust policy, the whole range of issues that affect Silicon Valley? Or do you think that it's still in Silicon Valley, Washington is irrelevant and, and uh, not, not important? Because I think, frankly, for the future of this country, it's extremely important that these two communities align better. Thank you. I, I think they're very engaged because 
When I was first out here 15 years ago, the attitude toward Washington, I was working for a Washington newspaper, was we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to go to Washington. The sooner uh, Washington falls off the map, the better. And about seven or eight years ago, all the major tech companies started ramping up huge numbers of lobbyists. They are intimately engaged with what goes on in Washington now and often very quietly get their way. So I think they're engaged, but they don't consider it a partnership, and that might be what's so dangerous. Like, I feel like the Valley is engaged with Washington, but in a sort of, a, as a necessary evil, and that their attitude toward Washington is, you know, that if, if Washington were out of the way, that the, they and we and private enterprise could solve all of these problems. And you'll hear VCs talk that way. Um, and that may be ultimately a dangerous attitude. I think that attitude is starting to change among some people um, in the Valley, but the, the condescension toward the idea of Washington, I think, is what is still divisive. Government tends to be towards rearward-looking things, in their view. Regulation protects older industries, right? And um, you know, education is, serves vested interests. And here there's this love affair with creating the new. And in this phase, things are so radical that there's almost a desire to leave the nation state behind. Look at Bitcoin, you know, a currency that has no government backing whatsoever. Um, but they're realizing there's a cost to that, and they really do have to educate Washington about what's being invented and developed now. And I think they're still pr pr pretty bad at it. I mean, like Mark Zuckerberg's biggest thing for the last year and a half has been uh, this push to get immigration reform, and he's totally failed on that. Um, I mean, it looks like it. And he spent a lot of money on that. Let's take a question from that side. Uh, Mark Hatch, CEO of TechShop, um, author of the Maker Movement Manifesto. Um, and next week will be the first uh, White House Maker Fair. I'd, I'd like to get the panel's response from uh, former Wired, um, uh, Chris Anderson, the editor at Wired. When he was recently, he was at a, a group of peers, and they basically asked him, why did you leave Wired and start a 3D you know, drone company? And his response was, if you thought the internet was big, this is going to be way bigger. So do, you, do you mean makers or drones? Uh, the next industrial revolution was ah. really the kind of the topic, manufacturing makers, 3D printers, and so forth. Broadly. Yeah. yeah. So is, is there a next generation? He runs a startup. <laughs> I mean, he, everyone who runs a startup thinks what they're doing is going to be the next big thing. <laughs> I think he's right. I, so your response is hyperbole. No, I, I, I do think he's right. It's never been cheaper and easier to create an idea, bring it to life in a prototype, and ship it around the world as software, and then have it created elsewhere. Completely changes the distribution model of many, many objects. And although I think that you know, the, the hyperbole is around 3D printers. If you go to someone like Neil Gershenfeld at MIT Media Lab, he says that the the 3D printer he has in his lab is about the fourth inter most interesting machine in his lab. It's actually digital manufacturing that's going to transform everything, not 3D printers by themselves. I, can, I take his point, though. I mean, if, if what the internet did was democratize, democratize information and give, you know, blogging changed publishing because it democratized the tools for writing, and then the internet changed media because it democratized the tools for creating and distributing media. If you can democratize the tools for creating and distributing yeah. things, you do all of a sudden potentially have a very different looking world. We are out of time. So thank you all very much. <laughs>